Hi, everyone. Welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm your host, Kevin Scott, Chief Technology Officer for Microsoft. In this podcast, we're going to get behind the tech. We'll talk with some of the people who've made our modern tech world possible and understand what motivated them to create what they did. So join me to maybe learn a little bit about the history of computing and get a few behind the scenes insights into what's happening today. Stick around. Hello and welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm Senior Developer Advocate at GitHub, Christina Warren. And I'm Kevin Scott. And here we are at the end of 2023 already, and what a huge year it's been in our world. It's hard to believe how much has changed this past year, what with like the widespread adoption and explosion of AI into the world. Yeah, it has been a crazy and big year. I sort of feel like we're uh, like living uh, AI dog years or something, <laughs> yes. uh, where you know I, I just can't even believe how much has happened in the past six months, uh, much mm-hmm. less the, the whole year. Um, so, you know, obviously this is uh, this is the, you know, in the past 12 months, we've had chat GPT released, we've had uh, GPT-4 release, and then we've had this crazy explosion of generative AI activity across the board from Microsoft and OpenAI and a whole bunch of other companies. Like it feels very much like... Uh, yeah, what it's felt like a couple of times earlier in my career where, yeah, with the PC revolution or the internet revolution or the smartphone revolution where like a big platform thing is happening and that everybody's excited about it and the, you know, smartest and most ambitious people are putting all of their energy into figuring out what this all means for them and like what useful things they're going to try to go make for other people on top of things that are newly possible. So, it's a super exciting moment. It's an extremely exciting moment. I've, I've been describing this to people for basically a year now. Is like, this is another iPhone moment. And, and that only becomes more and more true, I think, all the time. Uh, and, and on the podcast this year, it's been really exciting to hear folks talk about, uh, as you say, what's been happening now and, and the stories behind, you know, the years and years of work and research that have gotten us to this place. Because, of course, it feels like is all happening um, right now, but but this is the buildup of a a lot of hard work. So back in the spring, you got to talk to Bill Gates, who obviously is a huge force. Like, I think it's it's hard to express just how huge a force um, in technology um, uh, he has been for, for, for decades. Yeah. For for sure, and you know, like the obviously Bill was uh, Bill was one of the accelerators for the personal computing revolution. Like he played, yeah. uh, you know, maybe the most pivotal role there in founding Microsoft in the first place, and you know, pushing the personal computing revolution forward, and like played a tremendously important role in the internet revolution. Uh, you know, honestly, and. Uh, you know, so it was really great to spend some time chatting with him about AI and his perspective on like what this moment means, like how it is uh, similar to some of the things that he's seen in the past. And like, obviously, Bill's also been thinking about AI for you know his entire career. And so, you know, for all of us who have an interest in technology, seeing a thing that has gone from, you know, promising but not moving as fast as uh, all of us ambitious uh, people would like to actually making some pretty big breakthroughs has been just I think just as exciting for him as it has been for uh, for all of us yeah let's let's take a listen to that conversation I wonder you know what your advice might be to you know, people who are thinking about like, oh, I have this new technology that's amazing that I can now use. Uh, like, how how should they be thinking about how to use it? Like, how should they be thinking about the urgency with which they are, uh, you know, pursuing these new ideas? Uh, and, and, you know, and like, how does that relate to how you thought about uh, things in the PC era and the internet era? Yeah, so the industry starts really small you know, where computers aren't personal. And then uh, through the microprocessor and a bunch of companies, uh, we get the personal computer, IBM, Apple. And Microsoft got to be very involved in the software. You know, even the basic interpreter on the Apple II, very obscure fact, uh, was something that I did 
uh, for Apple. And that idea that, wow, this is a tool that, at least for editing documents, that you have to do all the writing, uh, you know, that was pretty amazing. And then connecting those up over the internet was amazing. And then moving the computation into the mobile phone uh, was absolutely amazing. So, you know, once you get the PC, the internet, the software industry, and the mobile phone, the digital world uh, is changing huge, huge parts of our activities. Uh, I was just in India, you know, seeing this, did how they do payments digitally, even, you know, for government programs. It's an amazing application of that, that world to help uh, people who never would have bank accounts because the fees are just too high, it's, it's too complicated. And so we continue to benefit from that foundation. I do view this, the uh, beginning of computers that read and write, as every bit as profound as, as any one of those steps. And a little bit surprising because robotics has gone a little slower than I would have expected. And I don't mean autonomous driving. I think that's a special case that's particularly hard because of the open-ended environment and the difficulty of safety and what bar safety bar people will bring to that. But even factories where you actually have a huge control over yeah. the environment of what's going on and you can make sure that you know no kids are running around anywhere near that that factory. So, you know, a little bit people have saying, okay, you know, these guys can over predict, which that's certainly correct. Uh, but here's a case where, you know, we under predicted that, that natural language and it's the computer's ability to deal with that and how that affects white collar jobs, including sales, service, you know, helping a doctor think through what to put in your health record. That I thought was many years off. And so all the AI books, even when they talk about things that might get a lot more productive, uh, will turn out to be wrong. And because we're just at the start of this, you could almost call it a mania like the internet mania. Yeah. But, you know, the internet mania, although it had its insanities and things that you know, I don't know, sock puppets or things where you look back and say, what were we thinking? Uh, it was a very profound tool that now we take for granted. And, you know, even just for scientific discovery, uh, you know, during the pandemic, the, the utility of the immediate sharing that took place there was just phenomenal. And so this is as big a breakthrough, a milestone as I've seen in the you know, whole digital uh, computer realm, uh, you know, which really s starts when I'm, I'm quite young. Yeah. Well, so I, I'm going to say this to you, and I, I'm, I'm just interested in uh, in your reaction because, uh, like, you you will always uh, like tell me when an idea is uh, dumb. But like, one of the things that I've been thinking for the last handful of years is that one of the big changes that's happening because of this technology is that for 180 years from the point that Ada Lovelace wrote the first program to harness the power of a digital machine up until today, the, the way that you get a digital machine to do work for you is you either have to be a skilled programmer, which is, uh, you know, like a, a, a barrier to entry that's that's not easy or you have to have a skilled programmer anticipate the needs of the user and to build a piece of software that you can then use to get the machine to do something for you and this may be the point where we get that paradigm to change a little bit where because you have this natural language interface and these ais can write code and like they will be able to actuate a whole bunch of services and systems that yeah we we sort of give ordinary people the ability to get very complicated things done with machines uh, without having to have like the, the, all of this expertise that you and I spent many, many years, uh, you know, building. No, absolutely. Every advance, you know, hopefully lowers the bar in terms of who can easily take advantage of it. 
you know, the spreadsheet was an example of that because even though you still have to understand these formulas, you really didn't have to understand logic or symbols much at all. And it had the input and the output so closely connected in this grid structure that the you didn't think about the separation of those two. And that that's kind of limiting in a way to a super abstract thinker, but it was so powerful in terms of the directness. Oh, that didn't come out right, let me change it. Here, there's a whole class of programs of taking like corporate data and presenting it or doing complex queries against, okay, have there been any sales offices where we've had 20% of the headcount missing and is, you know, are sales results affected by that? You can just, now you don't have to go to the IT department and wait in line and have them tell you, uh, oh, that's, you know, too hard or something. Most of these corporate uh, learning things, whether it's a query or a report or even a simple workflow where if something happens, you wanna trigger an activity, the description, in English will be the program. And when you want it to do something extra, you'll just pull up that English or whatever your language is in and type that in. And, you know, so there's a whole layer of, you know, query assistance and programming that uh, will be accessible to any employee. And, you know, the same thing is true of, okay, I'm somewhere in the college application process and I want to know, okay, what's my next step and what's the threshold for these things? You know, it's so opaque today. So empowering people to go directly and interact uh, is, that is the theme uh, that this is trying to uh, enable. It was incredible uh, to get to talk with Bill, not only about the specifics of how all of this stuff works, but also to get a sense of the big picture for this historic moment that we're in, as, as you alluded to, Kevin. Yeah, I mean, it, it has been a very long and, and winding road to get to where we are right now. And, you know, you said it earlier, it, this is, uh, you know, may feel like, um, yeah, all of a sudden it broke through and it was very abrupt, but it was because of decades and decades of work that, uh, you know, just an untold number of people have been doing. Um, but, but it has been really interesting, um, working with the folks at OpenAI. And we had this incredibly interesting conversation with Mira Marathi, who is OpenAI's CTO about, um, you know, her perspective is like, you know, sitting effectively in the hot seat of, you know, developing one of the most interesting pieces of technology that's resulted in the, you know, this breakthrough moment that we've had this past year. For sure. Let's take a listen. You know, uh, the first time that we thought about deploying these models that were just in research territory uh, was kind of a, this insane idea. It wasn't normal back then to go deploy a large language model in the real world. And, you know, what is the business case? What is it actually going to do for people? What problems is it going to solve? Like, we didn't really have those answers. Uh, but we thought, you know, if we make it accessible in such a way that it, it's easy to use and it is cheap, to use. Um, it is highly optimized. You don't need a lot of, um, you don't need to know all the bells and whistles of machine learning um, and just accessible, then maybe people's creativity would just bring to life, you know, new products and solutions. And we'd see how this technology could, could help us in the real world. And of course we had a hypothesis, but, but really it was just putting GPT-3 in the API the first time that we saw people interact with this large language models and the technology that we were building. And that for so many years, we had just been building in the lab without, you know, this real world contact and feedback from people out there. Um, so that was, that was the first time. It was sort of this 
leap of faith that it was going to teach us something. We were going to learn something from it. And hopefully we could feed it back into the technology. We could bring back that knowledge, that feedback, and figure out how to use it to make the technology better, more reliable, more aligned, safer, more robust when it eventually gets deployed in the real world. Um, and, you know, I, I always believe that you can just build this powerful technology in the lab with no contact with reality and hope that somehow it's going to go well um, yeah. and that it's going to be safe and beneficial for all. And somehow you do need to figure out how to bring society along, both in gathering that feedback and insight, but also in adjusting society to this change. And the best way to do that is for people to actually interact um, with the technology and see for themselves instead of, you know, telling them or uh, just sharing scientific papers. Um, so, so that was very important. And it took us then a couple of years to get to the point where um, we were not just releasing improvements to the model through the API, but um, in fact, the first interface that was more consumer facing that we played around with was DALI, DALI Labs, where people could just input a prompt in natural language. And then you'd see this beautiful, original, amazing images come up. Um, and, and then, you know, really for research reasons, we were um, experimenting with this interface of dialogue where you go back and forth with the model in chat GPT and uh, dialogue is such a powerful tool. You know, the idea of Socratic dialogue and how, how people learn, you can sort of correct one another um, and, or ask questions, get really to a deep, deeper truth. And so we thought, you know, if we, put this out there, even with the existing models, um, we will learn a lot. We will get a lot of feedback and we can use this feedback uh, to actually make our upcoming model that at the time was GPT-4 safer and, and more aligned. So that was kind of the motivation. And of course, as we saw, you know, in just a few days, it became super popular and people just loved interacting with this AI system. So when we talk about AI and we think about this stuff, it has been so powerful and so public uh, the way I think that the whole world has kind of been getting to learn about and experience the, the challenges of this this new wave of AI. You know, I kind of feel like we are in this, uh, you know, uh, before ChatGPT, after ChatGPT world. And, and that's really been evident this year. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, we, we, we had a really great opportunity uh, on the podcast and, and, uh, you know, me personally in my uh, professional life to have a bunch of really important conversations with Kevin Roos, uh, from the New York times. Um, so, you know, I, I think journalism has this really, really important role to play, uh, in helping frame what's happening right now. So like we're, we're doing part of the job, which is develop the technology and like try to responsibly get it deployed out to the public. Uh, but that's a tiny little part of the job of figuring out how to you know, get AI into the hands of the public in a reasonable way. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I've, I've been super excited uh, to have those conversations with journalists uh, this year. Yeah, this this conversation that you talked uh, you had with, with Kevin is actually one of my favorites this year. Uh, a because he's a former colleague, and B because I really do think, as you say, journalists play uh, a really important role in I think helping kind of bridge the understanding gap between what it is that is being created and, and all the things that we're working so hard on, and and how the general public is going to be able to kind of understand and uh, synthesize what all this means for them. So yeah, and is, for me personally, just, just yeah. You know, for 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 me personally, uh, you know, it, it also serves this really important role of making sure that you're not getting trapped in your own little bubble uh, that, you know, if you sit around and all you do is talk to your fellow technologists all day long, you can get convinced of some pretty wonky things. Uh, <laughs> and it's like really useful to have journalists and academics and policymakers and, uh, you know, and like in my mom in rural central Virginia, 
uh, able to like knock you out of your <laughs> bubble think. <laughs> No, I think I think you're exactly right. I mean, and I think that that is that's how we make sure that this is stuff that is not just useful in theory and and as you say in our own bubbles, but is actually something that could be world changing. So great conversation here. We are building some of the most we I say we I mean you essentially and and your peers in the tech industry are building some of the most powerful technology ever created, and I think without the media, there there just wouldn't be a kind of countervailing sort of i don't know i don't know if it's you know a, a force on the the minds of the people building that technology or just a caution around the technology um, but I'll, I'll give you an example of what i mean so you know you and i had this uh this now infamous encounter back in february where yeah. you guys had just released bing with this you know what we now know is gpt4 running inside of it and i yep. had this insane conversation with Bing Chat, aka Sydney, uh, please don't hurt me, Sydney. Um, and, uh, you know, went on the front page, went totally viral, blew up, I'm sure, you know, your inbox, my inbox, everyone's inbox for, for everybody's, months. Everybody's and, inbox. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and subsequent to that, like, I, I started hearing from, you know, just in a nutshell, if people aren't familiar, it was it was a, a conversation that sort of lasted two hours in which Bing slash Sydney, you know, uh, confessed all these sort of dark secrets and tried to break up my marriage and it was it was insane and and subsequent to that story running i got notes from a lot of other people at tech companies saying you know how do we prevent our technology from doing that or even i even uh, got a, a a leaked uh, document from another big tech company which had a sort of roadmap for their ai product and listed on the roadmap was like do not break up Kevin Roos's marriage. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so I really think that like that, and not to toot my own horn, this could have been anyone, but it it, it did really like serve yeah. as a cautionary tale for other companies that are building similar technology. And so I think that is what the media can and should do in moments of societal transformation and change is really hold a, a you know, a hold up a sign that basically tells people like, you know, you you, you want to do this right, or, yeah. you know, there will be, you know, there may be consequences for that. Yeah. And I think that is one of the very good things that came out of that experience. And, it, you know, it, I, it also, I think, is uh, it's another important reason why it is I think you actually want to launch these things, uh, you know, even if it results in something that uh, floods your inbox, uh, you know, for a while is like you just sort of get the societal level conversation about, you know, what's possible, what's going on, like, where's the line, like, what's good, what's bad. I mean, we, we haven't chatted uh, since that story published. Um and, and one thing that I will say is, like, I deeply appreciate the part of the writing that you did where you published the full transcript of the conversation. So, like, at that, that level of transparency, like, it, it just wasn't confusing to anyone about, you know, like, what inputs into the system led to, like, the things that it gave back. And, like, that was super good. I, I don't think many of the people who were coming into my inbox had read the full transcript. Uh, but I, I think the that that you're just a hundred percent spot on like the existence of this thing has like helped uh helped a lot of people like just make sure that they're paying real attention to you know to some very important things um and and also you know some of this stuff is fuzzy right like you know what where the line is and like part of what you are you all are helping doing is making sure that the public is paying enough attention to it so they can weigh in and have an opinion about where the line should be absolutely i mean it is um it is an area where i think more public opinion is is good and um right now the the number of people who are actually building this technology is is like quite small relative to the the number of people who are using it or who will soon be using it. And so yeah. I just think like the more people know about what's going on, the better. And, um, and, and I think it'll ultimately be good for the tech industry to have that kind of feedback, even if it is annoying and blows up your inbox in the moment. Yeah. I, and, and right, for, for what it's worth, it, it was like, I was never, uh, never annoyed about that. I was sometimes you were remarkably chill. I, you know, I was, I was, um, I was pleasantly surprised by, by like the, you know, the, the response that, you know, you and I talked 
after I had had this conversation, but before I sort of published my story, yeah. and, you know, you didn't freak out. You didn't accuse me of lying. You know, it was, it was um, a remarkably civil uh, conversation. And I, I just, I have appreciated that because that's not, and I'm not just blowing smoke here. Like that is, that is not the reaction that I expected, you know, given how <laughs> these things can go with other, uh, with other tech leaders. So I guess I'm just, I'm hopeful that the response to that article has not the lesson from that has not been that we should build in secret and should never let no, anyone no, no, try no, our no, stuff no, 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 no. i i hope that it is like been sort of salutary for the whole um project of building good and safe and responsible ai to like have some feedback along the way 100 percent uh like i don't i don't think anybody was I, I like I'm genuinely trying to think if anyone was irritated. It's like everybody is sort of like, OK, this is good. Lesson learned. And like, you know, we have a whole bunch of mechanism for, uh, you know, preventing things like that from happening again. And uh, I mean, it's just just it's it's all good. Like um, somebody said to me at some point that uh, like all feedback is a gift, like the fact that you spent two hours uh, trying very hard to get this thing to do uh, unusual things it, it, and then publish the whole transcript uh, and then wrote this article that helps people pay more attention to the importance of responsible AI. Like all of that's a gift. Uh, like, and that's the way you should just sort of look at it. Yeah, I'll, I'll remind, uh, you know, tech executives of that the next time I, I get an angry call from a comms department. You know, Kevin Scott <laughs> thinks feedback is a gift. So maybe you guys should get on board with that. Uh, I did also hear that you guys had Sydney swag made, and I'm a little offended that none of that has shown up in my house. Did you hear that th about the beer? So this was my, my favorite thing that came out of that article was that a, there was a brewery in Minneapolis that that came out with a beer called Sydney Loves Kevin. And yes. I have not tried it yet. Um, I, I heard it was good, but uh, you know, maybe you and I can get a pint pint of it sometime. We 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 should absolutely make a road trip to Minnesota <laughs> to get a pint. That would that would be hilarious. <laughs> it's just so exciting to me how much technology and AI are becoming part of the mainstream conversation. It it really does make me think about the episode we did with Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is one of my heroes, like in addition to being a brilliant astrophysicist, Neil, I think is, in, in my opinion, the best science communicator since Carl Sagan. Uh, and I think, you know, Neil you know, tried to model a lot of what he's doing after Carl. And yeah, he just does a terrific job of helping explain some incredibly complicated uh, scientific concepts to the public, uh, but not in a condescending way. Um, so I, I just love Neil to death. Yeah, I, I, I do too. He's also one of my heroes. And I think you're exactly right. He is definitely one of our best, if you know, not the best like living science communicator that we have. And, and I think it's so important that we have people like him in these moments. Um, as you say, I think helps get us out of our bubbles a little bit. And, and also I think helps put this again into terms that, that people who might not follow along with every little thing, um, can, can understand and, and get excited about and, and also start to think the important questions about. So, um, this is a great conversation with, with Neil. Right. Right. Well, actually, so I think much less about kids than I do about adults. Yeah. Because kids are born curious and they retain that curiosity at least into middle school. So I'm not so worried about them as I am about adults who think they're thinking rationally and are not. And adults are in charge of the world. They wield resources. They vote. They lead. They're captains of industry. They're all the things that shape this world. So... My, I, I, yeah, we can target children, but I'm too impatient. I don't want to wait 30 years until they're old enough to then make a difference. Whereas adults can make a difference with the signet, with a pen at the bottom of a document that puts a new legislation into effect or yeah. new educational uh, directives or new mission statements. So, uh, so that's been my, uh, my goal. Now, in terms of role model, I think the term is a little overplayed, overvalued, I should say, mm -hmm. for, for the following reason. I, I grew up in the Bronx, New York, and if I needed 
another black person who grew up in the Bronx before me, who then became an astrophysicist, to have <laughs> preceded me, I would have never become an astrophysicist. Yeah. So role models, inherent as they're generally thought of, inherently require that you are not the first to do something. But suppose you have interest where you would be the first to do something, either first out of your town, like you said, you're the first, what's your, your role model can't have been people Correct. in your town because none of them went to college. So, or in your family, all right. So yep. at some point you have to say, my role model is someone I have never met and I may never meet, but I know enough about them that I want to emulate what happened in their life. And so from, I knew this from very early. So I had an athletic role model of, you know, baseball, of course. I mm -hmm. grew up in the Bronx where the Yankees play. So yep. there was a Yankee that was a role model. I didn't want to be him. Just that if I played baseball, I wanted to play baseball as well as he did. All right. Mm -hmm. That's all. And yep. I visited my local planetarium, the Hayden Planetarium, took extra classes there. They had educators and scientists. And they had educators that had such a way with words and storytelling. I said, if I'm ever an educator, that's the kind of educator I want to be. And the scientists had such command of, and they just knew uh, it's so much. And the weird thing is, I, I remember thinking, I will never know this much about the universe as much yes. as they do. Meanwhile, they're twice my age at least. And I'm, I'm 15 when I'm having these thoughts. <laughs> okay. And not realizing that when you get a PhD, you spend a whole five, six years studying that one subject. Yep. All right. And six years before that, I was nine. So so I had to get the time scales understood within me. Yeah. But so for me, a role model at its best is assembled a la carte from different people. And that's why if you're visible, you should always in the back of your head, ask yourself, am I being something that someone else might want to emulate? Because that chance is very real, whether or not you ever meet the person. And uh, so when I see little children coming through the Hayden Planetarium is part of the American Museum of Natural History. There's school groups that come through, tour, many tour international tourists, but also um, camp groups. I see little kids and they're looking bright eyed. And all I committed is that whatever I help create there will have the impact on that ge next generation the way the educators and scientists had an impact on me. Yeah. Then I've given back to this world. And then when we talk about how important it is to bring people into science and technology, uh, a lot of that I think comes from being able to inspire them and their creative minds. Yeah. Um, there are so many structural barriers for a lot of people. And it's really easy, I think, for folks to get confused about um, how much luck and good fortune is involved in, you know, all of us uh, who have the privilege of, you know, having interesting, uh, you know, careers where we get to like have a little slice of impact on uh, on an industry, uh, like how much luck plays a role in that for us. Uh and so, you know, William Adams, uh, who worked for me uh, for a while in Octo, he was one of the first people I hired when I came to work for Microsoft, is uh, just an incredible human being, like a source of inspiration uh, for me personally. Uh, and, you know, the extent to which he has dedicated his life, not just to being a better engineer, but uh, as a black engineer trying to figure out like how he goes and addresses some of those structural impediments uh, to having more folks who are historically underrepresented in this field uh, be able to participate. Uh, like it's just really, really inspiring um, you know, seeing, seeing what Will has chosen to do with his life. Yeah, well, let, let me put on my speed mouth then. Uh, the general, the general thing is, and this started back with, uh, when George Floyd was killed. Um, I kind of really sat and thought, it's like, okay, what am I going to do? I mean, this is not the first black man who's ever been killed by police. He's not going to be the last, but this is a good moment because it was caught on 4K video. People are kind of paying attention. What am I going to do? Right. 
And I, one thought was, well, I've got money. I can just kind of throw money out to people, <laughs> you know, and, and be that kind of philanthropist. Like, nah, that, once your money's gone, that, that effect is gone. Um, well, I have 40 plus years in tech and I know that tech billionaires are kind of the, the top of the world right now. So that means there's more money in tech. Uh, why don't I help get more people into tech? Right. So then that led to, well, there's lots of different models for that as well. I could invest, I could be a, an, uh, LP in someone else's thing or, um, whatever. There's lots of different ways of doing it. And I just came up with a model. I was like, well, what matches my skills and experience and network best? So I came up with the studio model, right? A venture studio. And the difference between a venture studio and a, a plain old VC is, or an accelerator is I tell people, think of Motown, right? The, I'm the Barry Gordy, right? I'm gonna find the talent, I'm gonna train the talent, I'm gonna find Aretha Franklin, I'm gonna find Michael Jackson, I'm gonna help th show them how to dance, stage presence, give them a, the record uh, contract, put them out on uh, in the network and, and help them build their thing, right? Do that with software, so it's about, um, creating software, creating a network, having a finance network, um, having resources as simple as, as soon as you start your business, you need a tax accountant or else you're just gonna fall behind on your taxes and you're gonna be out of business in a year. Uh, you need an admin, <laughs> you know? So yep. you need three or four programmers. You're not gonna write the code yourself. Um, and when you fail, you need someone to say, that's all right, let's do it again, right? And this is something that typically um, black and, and women businesses don't have, right? They struggle to do it once, they get burned, they're working at McDonald's or they're back to general population. They don't try again because they got obligations. So the studio is intended to put a little cushion that they don't normally have in the, in the society such that they can have enough longevity to succeed, right? Uh, so I've been doing a lot of uh, network building. Um, I've been writing tons of code because the, the other thing that I'm telling people is, okay, AI is the thing. Um, two years ago, I would have told you, go out and learn you some C-sharp, <laughs> you know, and web development. Now it's like, no, no, no. First, you need to go play with ChatGPT. And if you're going to write any code at all, you're going to use Copilot, right? Um, and I'm not just saying that because I'm shilling for Microsoft. It's like, I do it myself and it makes me 30% more productive, uh, at least. So, um, I train that and the software I'm writing is about saying, how can I write code such that it's going to be more composable when I use AI to do it? Right. So, for example, um, there's, uh, zip, the zip file format, right? Compressed files. There's a library for that and it has its quirks. I wrote one myself. I have my own zip decoder and the interface is so simple that when I wanna say, now compress that and stick it in a zip, it's one function, three parameters done, right? Yep. Clear licensing. I don't have to worry about all the licensing all over the place. And that's a difficulty when you start stitching with AI. It's like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Where did that data come from? Where did that code come from? Where did do you have the right license for that chunk of code right there? So I'm creating a substrate of code that's like, this is clear licensed, right? Uh, and, and here's how you program leveraging AI, right? This is how we have to do it. This is how we're going to 10x our abilities, right? Is by leveraging AI. You can't just go and lock yourself in a room and think you're going to hammer out some code. By the time you're done, someone else who's got AI has already done it 10 times over. <laughs> so you better learn how to do it with AI, right? So this is this is what I'm currently engaged in. Yeah, honestly, William's work, what he's doing is so inspiring, as you say, and, and what he's accomplished in his time at Microsoft and now after Microsoft is so impressive. And I... I loved that conversation between the two of you. And, and I, it, it's great that we have people like him who are doing this important work and, and really working to, to inspire the next generation. Yeah, for, for sure. I mean, maybe, maybe the theme of this podcast, like the people that we talk to are folks who are just deeply passionate about something and who are fully committed to pursuing that passion. And it's just a great 
pleasure to be able to chat with so many people who have that uh, that mindset. And you know, one of those conversations that we had this year was with. Uh, my very favorite science fiction author right now, uh, uh, Adrian Tchaikovsky, who has written just really incredible hard science fiction books. Uh, you know, he's got a super interesting background, as many science fiction authors uh, do. Like he is a, a zoologist uh, and lawyer, uh, you know, by by training. Um, and you know, I, I think he wrote. Maybe inadvertently, like one of the most important books on uh, contemporary artificial intelligence, uh, which was the third installment of a trilogy that he wrote called uh, Children of Memory, uh, where, of all things, um, pairs of corvids, uh, you know, uh, intelligent birds uh, are maybe the best metaphor that I have seen for uh, large language models. Uh, it's just an incredible, uh, you know, thing that that came from his imagination before large language models really were doing some of the things that they could do. Um, and, and so it was just tremendous to be able to spend some time talking with Adrian, not just about his craft, but about uh, what inspires him to write the things that he does and like what some of his takes are as a creative person, like a writer, about what this AI moment means for him and people practicing his craft. So like it's it's just a uh, yeah, great conversation and, and wanted to give people a chance to listen to a little snippet of that uh, conversation in this in this uh, year in review we're doing here. I mean, when I'm working from the point of view of a non-human entity, whether it's um, a sort of an uplifted animal or an alien or something like that, it's generally the start point is the input. So you look at what the senses it has, how it experiences the world around it, and that then that gives you a very good filter through which to look at the world and interpret the things that are going on around this this particular character. It gives it its own very sort of set of priorities that can be quite different to human because we're very, very limited to, to our senses. I mean, that our entire picture of what goes on around us is, is, um, fed to us through, um, the various ways that we sense our environment. And when those ways go wrong or when those ways are given, giving us uncertain, uh, uncertain information, you can get some sort of profoundly weird, and dysfunctional um dysfunctional um worldviews uh, generating from that which can be extremely hard to dissuade someone from even if even if you were even if you knew that you you had a problem which meant that you you know you were seeing things you were hallucinating the that doesn't necessarily mean that the hallucinations aren't themselves still incredibly powerful. I mean, it's very, it's very hard not to react to a thing that your eyes are telling you is there. Yeah. It's, I mean, sleep paralysis is a, a perfect um, example of that because most people who have it are well aware of what's going on when it's happening, but that doesn't make it any less scary. Yeah. I mean, I think a really uh, good example of this are the portids uh, from uh, the the Children of Time, which are the the spiders who are the, you know, become the protagonist of the story. Uh, and, and yeah, I don't, I don't want to give too much away about the book for folks who haven't read it. Um, but you, you, you basically develop this very complicated society of intelligent spiders uh, and, um, you yeah, which is a really interesting premise. And like part of what makes them so compelling is the, the, their sensorium is very different from humans. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, weirdly enough, they are, they're also still considerably more human than, um, the, uh, either of the two major non-human and non-human points of view presented in the next book. Yep. Uh, because they're still very visual creatures. They're land creatures. And there is a certain kind of factor in their evolution which is going to make them more human than they might otherwise be. But at the same time, um, so spiders have a whole suite of senses that we can't really easily imagine. They have um, 
the ability to sense um, sort of scents and chemicals in, in a way that we can't. They have ability, especially to, to sense vibration in the way that we can't. So they live in a world that is constantly informing them of things uh, that we would be completely oblivious to. And so you, as there's, um, and the way I go about this is, I kind of work in sort of organic stages. Well, you know, if they're like this, then what would their what would their sort of early development be? And then just building on each other state at each stage to make this more and more complex um, society as they go th as the book takes them through time. And you get a society which has a lot of, um, for example, technology that builds on their own strengths. They can do a lot of things that we can't quite early on purely because they have a lot of tools. Um, even down to just being able to spin web, which gives you the ability to make, say, watertight containers very, very early on in your society, which is a major, you know, making things like clay pots and so forth is a major step forward for human society. And it's much harder for us because we have to use fire and we have to make them where the spiders can just literally produce them from their own bodies. Uh, and so little things like that then go on to have enormous implications to how their society society develops and it also um it also affects the way that they're they conceptualize of more uh, of less kind of physical things so you have one point where there's an effort to try and communicate a picture um from one culture to another and they run into the basic problem that when, when a human is is coding a picture in a sort of a mathematical form we start at the top left or where you know one one of the corners depend you know possibly culturally dependent and we work um, that work through the rows. These spiders start in the middle and spiral outward. That makes perfect sense to them because how can you necessarily know how big the picture is going to be when you start it? You don't know. Um, and so you just start and keep working until you've got all the picture. But it means that a lot of um, a lot of basic ideas, even when they have a means of communication, become very hard to communicate because the way you're thinking about them is very different. Yeah, I, I loved hearing Adrian talk about, you know, how he's thinking about creating these these species and civilizations. Uh, I still fundamentally consider myself a writer first and foremost. And so I love hearing about the creative process that that other writers, writers more talented than me like him can do and and how also kind of thinking the broader terms about how, you know, sensory input and, and uh, you know, can shape kind of everything and how we operate and kind of the influence of, of, you know, art can have on science and vice versa. Yeah, another person who's thinking about some of this stuff in a really significant way uh, was on the podcast this year. So uh, and one of our most engaging conversations, the uh, the pioneer of emotion AI, Rana al Kalyubi, um, she believes and I agree with her that we're missing out on a huge amount of data that we could be using to train our AIs to make these systems um, uh, more not human like, but more relatable to humans. Uh, we had a super interesting conversation, which we're going to listen to right now. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 exactly what your friend is saying, like empathy and emotions are at the center of how we connect and communicate as humans. And our emotional experiences drive our decision making, whether it's a big decision or a small decision. It drives our learning, our memory. Um, it drives this human connection. It's how we build trust. It's everything. But if you look at how we think about technology, it's often what I call the IQ of the device, you know, take chat GPT, right? Very smart, very intelligent. Um, but it's all very focused on the IQ, the cognitive skills. And um, I felt like it was out of balance with our emotional and social intelligence skills. And, and I wanted to marry the IQ and the EQ in our in our machines, basically. And so I had to go back. I'm a computer scientist by background, and but I had to like study the emotion, the science of emotions and how do we express emotions as human beings? And it turns out 93% of how we communicate is nonverbal. Mm -hmm. It's a combination of our facial expressions, you know, our hand gestures, our vocal intonations, like how much energy is in our voice, all of these things. And only 7% is in the actual choice of words we use. So I yeah. feel like there's been a lot of emphasis on the 7%, but the 93% has been lost in cyberspace. So I'm kind of reclaiming that 93% using yeah. computer vision and machine learning technologies that weren't available, you know, 20 years ago, but now they're ubiquitous. Yeah. 
I, look, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, in, in 2016, I dialed back almost all of my social media consumption because y you effectively have these machine learning systems, uh, like particularly for businesses where their business model is engagement. Uh, so like the more you engage with the platform, the more ads run and the more money that you uh, make. Uh, it is very easy to like get systems that uh, get the engagement by triggering your amygdala and like keep you in this. And it's very easy to be triggered by email. Like I, 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 I all the time have email conversations with colleagues where like I get super agitated by the email conversation. And if I just jump into a, a video call with them, even like not even face to face, but uh, you know what we're doing right now, like in seconds, like all of the stuff that I was agitated about goes away. So I'm just super intrigued by what you're doing. Like, how, how do we actually get this rolled out more broadly? Because I, I think you're absolutely right. Like we've focused so much on the text and text is so rife with opportunity to get us uh, emotionally activated in the wrong way. Wrong way, right. Because there's a lot of c confusion and am ambiguity where you can clarify that when you see the face or hear the voice. Um, I mean, I think what's really cool about this and what ended up being both the opportunity, but also the biggest challenge for Affectiva, you know, when we spun out of MIT, was that there are so many applications of this technology. And so we try to focus, but it's it was always this challenge of like, oh my God, like there are so many cool applications. And so some that I think are really powerful. One is the automotive industry where, you know, mm -hmm. we ended up selling to SmartEye and they're very focused on bringing driver monitoring solutions, um, you know, to the world. And so this idea of understanding driver distraction and, you know, if you're texting while driving, well, we can tell that using computer vision, right? Look at your yep. eyes, your head movement. And if you have a phone in your hand, drowsiness, intoxication even we can we've started like doing a lot of research to detect that using cameras you know optical sensors um so automotive is one one area um we can do advanced safety solutions we can look at like are is there a child seat in the car and, a, and, a, and an infant in it and often not often but about 50 kids or so get forgotten in the car every year and they die of heat so so that's very fixable we can fix that um Mental health is another space that I'm really fascinated by. That we know that there are facial and vocal biomarkers of mental health disease, depression, anxiety, stress, um, even Parkinson's. So imagine if we, every time we hop in front of our computer with people's opt-in, of course, we can kind of articulate your baseline using machine learning. We, we know your baseline. And then if you start deviating from it, we can flag that to you or a loved one or, you know, psychiatrist. So I think there's there's a lot of opportunity, um, but we're missing the scale. That actually kind of makes me think about how connected uh, to creativity so many of our guests have been as, as we've kind of been going through this year in review. And so let's share a clip now from Will I Am. Uh, he talked about technology and how it changed the music industry in a super, super interesting way. Yeah. So imagine this is 1970 and uh, you're a drummer from a band that's pretty popular and you're a drummer that's coming up and you have aspirations as a drummer. And then like there was a drum machine, but you weren't really threatened by the drum machine. Cause it sounded like doo, 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 doo. didn't really sound like drums. And then the eighties come around and the Lin 900 started sounding a little bit more realistic, but it was like stiff and robotic. And then Prince really like made some pretty awesome songs with the Lin 900. And then the, uh, Akai um, MPC-60 drum machine came and now you could sample live drums and put the swing on it and it kind of sounds realistic. And then 2000 comes around you're like, yo, fuck these drum machines, bro. Like, all the songs on the radio are fucking drum machines. In the 70s, it was all human beings. Tight. Mm -hmm. You gotta be super precise. Mm -hmm. And the drum machine ate up a lot of the freaking, like, drum time for, for drummers on the radio. And since then, mm -hmm. live drums on the radio and on streaming, you don't hear no live drums anywhere on the radio. But what happened was the drummer, a lot of them became the producer. 
because they were like, you know what, if this is the case, I'm going to learn this machine and I'm going to produce and the role of the drummer. They made more money. They, uh, because the drummer never got publishing anyways. Cause how can you, what's, what's the, what's the publishing on drums? Right. So uh, the drummer in the band always got the shitty end of the stick when it came to ownership of the song, because how, what, what part did you write? I wrote this. Boons, clats, boons, clats. Data. Everybody says boom, clats, boom, clats. No, I said boom, clats, to good, boom, clats. Yep. Everybody says boom, clats, to good, good, boom, clats. So when it came to the, the, how everyone participated, the drummer was always, you know, last. And that sucks. But the drum machine and producing on computers really empowered the drummer. The same is for music, the whole entire package now. It's just drums. It's guitars, it's bass lines, it's freaking chord progressions, ensembles, like orchestral. They, everything of music is now going through what the drummer went through in the 70s to the 2000s. Now, the guy with the idea, the girl with the idea, the person with the idea, now they don't need the whole entire studio. They don't need a whole entire band. They just need their idea, and the machine will supercharge them the way the drum machine and the, and the DAW supercharge the drummer. That's the optimistic point of it all. Then there's like a bunch of negative stuff uh, that I don't even want to entertain because I think we, what we should be doing with AI is not just to augment yesterday. Yes. It's going to, uh, you know, render how we used to do things kind of obsolete or create new ways of doing things that undermine like how we used to get paid. There's going to be new ways that we get paid. A song is going to be a lot deeper right now, but MTV said, Hey, now don't just write the song. Um, do a video. That video used to be just promotion. If you wanted to go and sing in a, you know, you're from LA, but you want to tour all of America. Lo other locations were like, well, send me, send me a, like a demo of what your show is going to be. And I could put you on TV. So they would do that promo clip that MPV hijacked and said, these are videos. Those are promo clips. It was never a part of what a record contract was to be. And a record contract was based on the, the limitation of lacquer. And even though that the, we, we had technology like mini disc and CDs that there were no more limitations, music is still composed as if there were limited space on a disc. A song is three minutes and 33 seconds. An album is 12 songs on it just because of the RPMs 33 that it went around the record and the tempos of every pop song was the limited. So even with, you know, with, with this advanced technology that we have, it's still basing it on limited. So that means you have to reimagine what a song is, just like they reimagined what a song was from the 1800s when it was just theater and opera. When it came to the recording industry, they're like, okay, okay, we got to change a different song format here. You know, Muddy Waters, that song is too long. I need you to shorten it. Because when they would sing the blues, they would sing. There was no time limit. They would just go to a bar. You hear somebody sing and they sung for fucking hours. A song is like a reduction of, of, uh, of the song uh, 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 sequence because of a limitation of the technology. So that means with AI and AI music, somebody has to reimagine what the fuck a song is. It's a discussion. It's a place for you to put your memories, uh, a place for the song to to alter based on your mood. Like I got a feeling it's not just for what, what's the version of I got a feeling when you're pissed. I just wrote the one that you're, when you're optimistic, where's the love is like when something goes wrong, what about when something is right? Like, and then there's songs like boom, boom, pow. They're about nothing. <laughs> hey, what's, what's boom, boom, yeah. pow about? I don't know. Nothing. Like <laughs> it's describing the song. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this song is promoting the song that I wrote. <laughs> what song? This one right here that I'm singing. <laughs> which is awesome. which is a crazy concept of songwriting. Like, what do you what are you going to write about? I don't really know. That I'm going to write about this song I'm writing. <laughs> um, but you have to change AI. It's an opportunity to reimagine what a song is, to reimagine what it means in your life, to reimagine what it means to the world.
where it's discussion based. We need to like inspire the creative community to use AI not just for entertainment, but to reimagine the world. Tomorrow's industries are what? Tomorrow's jobs are what? If AI is going to replace jobs, it's going to create new jobs. So shouldn't the creative community also be tasked to like imagine what tomorrow is with it? Or are we just going to freaking pretend that we're going to make songs forever? No, that ain't the case. You ain't going to be making songs forever for business like we used to. You're going to be making experiences with it. You're going to be scoring moments in different ways of scoring moments, but it isn't going to look anything like yesterday. No. All right. I, I really am seeing a theme here, you know, kind of seeing the intersection of creativity and innovation and technology and how all of these things influence one another. Yeah. Even Toby Lucca, who is one of my absolute favorite engineers, in addition to being the incredible entrepreneur and founder of Shopify, and I were talking about some of these ideas about the change that's coming and how change influences the nature of craft and creativity. Um, we had a really fascinating conversation where we reflected on this, uh, which you all are going to get to hear a little bit of right now. The core of a craft is like conversion something into something, right? Like like every craft that exists is sort of a, a like that, that particular process. It's like people people who convert wood into furniture are carpenters. <laughs> and yep. they, 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 one thing which is really inspired about um, these things is that very rarely is the identity of a, um, a carpenter that they are carpenter. The identity is actually that they are craftsperson, and um, that uh, uh, the particular uh, craft that they are. Um, um, that they've pursued and they've done their, uh, uh, they become a meister in, is usually just their aptitude. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, but it, but it's a very common type of person, which is also really really useful because therefore it's um, some crafts exist for a moment and then they don't exist anymore when they're no longer needed. Like we, like mm -hmm. like the, the blacksmiths kind of figured out what to do next. Um, and yeah. um, so I think that's uh, like all of this is actually really worth sort of understanding. Um, and. Uh, because you know, like I, I, I do sometimes talk to uh, you know junior engineers who describe themselves as I'm a React front end and developer. And I'm like, wow, you just put two two little bits into your identity that uh, <laughs> you, you really don't need to. Because I, I like I, I think you you are actually uh, much more than that because you can solve problems extremely well. The, yeah. the rallying cry is like people who um, be were able to make the things um, that they really want with what they got. Like that's yeah. that, that's sort of at the core of it, and I love that. So, our last guest of the year is really looking towards the future. David Kirtley and his company Helion are working to build the world's first nuclear fusion power plant, which, uh, as the words come out of my mouth, sounds incredibly audacious, uh, but. If you really think about the biggest challenges facing us as a species, uh, having access to not just a clean energy supply, but uh, abundance of energy, like where we can have way more power than we have now available to us to help us to you know, fulfill and achieve our biggest ambitions is super, super important. I, I completely agree. And I have to say, you know, audacious or not, and I think audacious is a great word for it. Listening to you and David talk got me so excited about what the potential uh, in the future could be um, if, if these things can, can come to fruition. So let's close out now with your conversation with David. But like, I think the thing that people really miss, and like, you probably have a better perspective on this than I do, is that Starting somewhere in the 1970s, like we just stopped using energy at the rate that we had been using it before. Uh, and and like it, it's actually a staggering thing to think about, you know, not not just like what happens if we could take the energy that we're consuming right now and it's like more sustainable. But like what happens if like energy becomes sustainable and cheap and abundant enough where you could use a hundred times more, a thousand times more, or 10,000 times more of it than you're using right now. What's then possible? So like to talk, talk a little bit about like why, uh, why energy matters. Yeah. I think about this a lot actually. Um, and, um, from two perspectives, one is just recently we're starting to use more electricity. 
it's we're upticking for the first time in a long time where in the 1970s and 80s we plateaued in a lot of ways in terms of our energy use i think that's totally right but recently electric transportation probably computation and ai kicks into that too um and then um and looking at ways to solve climate change by spending electricity um then goes in and and starting to increase our, our demand for electricity. Um, the other thing I tie to in this is standard of living directly ties with access to electricity, low cost electricity. So you look at different parts of the world and standard of living, and you can say like, okay, great. They have more electricity access. They have more standard of living, however you want to define that. But I asked the same question, what happens if we had 10 times? Does that mean our standard of living would be 10 times? What does that mean? Would we have access to cleaner access to Clean water desalination is the classic. There's a there's a trigger at the one to two cent per kilowatt hour where if you can have electricity at that cost, then now you can desalinate water through electrolysis and other methods directly. Clean water is now cheaper than it was to actually like pull it out of a, of a river and purify it. And so suddenly, you know, you enable some of those things, which are clear. But I think through, you know, um, if you had you know, the computational access where you can have large scale servers at, at everybody's house. You got to get the maybe the server price down, but now you can actually do really interesting things on the computation and the cooling around that. Um, yeah, I, I, look, I, I think the w one of the things that maybe people don't appreciate or think about clearly enough is maybe everything good that has ever happened in the history of humankind is humans discovering new sources of energy and being able to put that energy to work solving problems that benefit humans and so in a sense like you actually want to be able to consume more energy you don't want the consumption of energy to be a bad thing because nominally consuming more energy means you're doing more of those useful things for humanity uh, you know, like electrolysis, like, I mean, one of the things here in the state of California is like we have parts of the state where you have abundant water and you have parts of the state where you have no water. And like one of the reasons that California is habitable is we spend an enormous amount of energy pumping water from places where it's abundant to places where it's scarce. Yep. Uh, and like, I think you're going to have to do more of that in the future with climate change. Uh, so you know, you, you really do want a world where you have cheap, abundant energy, which is why I think the problem you're working on is, like, I think artificial intelligence is a pretty important problem. That's the thing I spend most of my time working on. But I think your problem is more important than my problem. And my problem is dependent on your problem. <laughs> yeah, at some scale, your problem, our two problems work together. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know that we know, frankly, what happens if you have more energy more low cost electricity, particularly ones, it has to be low cost. That's really important. If it just costs a lot more and you have more of it, it, it doesn't actually help help the situation where um, the essentially effective cost of burning wood to burning coal to vision power and then to renewables that are some of the renewables when you have access to good sunlight, solar power can be really low cost. Um, does you have these these stage gates for humanity that you unlock, and and I and I so I don't know that we know the answer to that, um, but I'm excited to find out. That's for sure. That was a whirlwind tour of our incredible 2023 guests on Behind the Tech this year. You can check out this full episodes uh, on your favorite podcast platform uh, and on YouTube. Um, so be sure to check those out. And if you have anything that you would like to share with us, you can email us anytime at behindthetech at microsoft.com. Thank you for tuning in and we will see you in 2024. See you next time.